Hello and welcome to another podcast in our Let's Talk series produced and brought to you by Hazel and Betty Ford. As always, I'm your host, William C. Moyers, and today our focus is on refugees, immigration, trauma, and substance use disorders. My colleagues, Dr. Demir Ertzen and Manuel Garcia. Manuel is the outpatient program manager at Hazel and Betty Ford site in St. Paul, Minnesota. Demir is the manager of mental health services at our main site in Center City, Minnesota. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us. So we're gonna talk about a big topic today. Um, some people would say, well, Hazel and Betty Ford doesn't know a lot about that. Uh, refugees, immigration, trauma, and substance use disorders. But we're actually learning a lot, and you all know it personally. Manuel, would you share? I would actually say that Hazel and Betty Ford supported me in my immigration process. So thanks for having me again, Excellent. William. Um, my name is Manuel Garcia, and I'm originally from Mexico City, and I immigrated to the United States in 2013. Uh, because I wanted to go through our Hazel and Betty Ford Graduate School. And uh, uh, I graduated in uh, 2014 and I've been with the organization since. And the reason why I mentioned that Hazel and Betty Ford is supported, was supportive of me is because uh, in order for me to stay in the United States after going through the graduate school, uh, I needed to be sponsored. And Hazel and Betty Ford did that for me and that's the reason why I'm able to be here today. And we're glad you're here. Thanks. Demir. Thank you, uh, William, for having me on again. Very similar to Manuel's story, I'm a refugee from Bosnia, the former Yugoslavia, and throughout my uh, career and, and, and personal life, I've really been drawn towards the intersection of trauma, substance use, and, and migration. And so throughout my training uh, in, in graduate school, I specialized in working with survivors of politically sanctioned torture, and I served mm -hmm. in capacities of a forensic evaluator, and then even did some work on public policy and advocacy, for instance, working with the uh, um, American Bar Association Children's Immigration Law Academy mm -hmm. on helping attorneys across the country set precedent and implement precedents mm -hmm. for uh, uh, applications for deferred status of unaccompanied minors. Let me stick with you for just a second, Demir. We know that the war in Ukraine is, is a refugee crisis. Um, what is it, when you see the images, when you see the videos from Ukraine, what does it mean to you? you know, over time, when you experience a traumatic event or anything that is out of the ordinary, I, I think in order to survive, you, you compartmentalize because otherwise it, it sometimes it becomes difficult. And that is not to say that it's uh, maladaptive or inappropriate. There is a healthy degree of separation. And given my, my career and everything that I've done, I, to some degree, was insulated from it. And at the same time, a few weeks ago when the uh, conflict was kind of escalating. I was sitting in the morning watching the news and I was exhausted as a result of working several hours over that past week and out of nowhere tears began to, to stream down my face mm. and that caught me off guard because I thought well mm. okay I've, I've been through this I've worked with it why now? And part of me was also ashamed, which is interesting, right? Because I'm, I'm a trained therapist, I've worked with the community and there's nothing to be ashamed of. But to me that speaks that trauma is intergenerational, it becomes integrated, it becomes part of our narrative, our story, and, and it doesn't truly ever leave us. So trauma in the Latinx community, do, is it recognized, Manuel? I, I think so. I certainly recognize it. Uh, you know, similar to Demir, there's been a couple of times where I hear news stories that just bring tears down my face. Like, for example, the, the shooting in, in Texas that happened recently. Um, you know, one of the hardest things for me in, in that situation was uh, finding out that the, that the shooter was a, was a Latinx uh, community member. Mm. Uh, and I, too, myself was driving into work uh, the day after and just tears started uh, uh, coming and, and I think it's because uh, when, when one of us suffers, right. all of us suffer. And, and I don't think that's something that, that uh, ever goes away. Uh, another event was the whistleblower talking about the, the calamities that happened and with women uh, trying to get help from, from physicians and being abused. You know, uh, when I heard about that story, I also, um, it's like, at first you're in shock, you can't believe that it's happening, and then it's just a deep pain that this, this is happening to your people. So 
uh, for me, it's uh, as much empathy as it is mm. uh, a personal experience, because even though I haven't gone through anything like that, uh, it's people from my community that are suffering, and that's always difficult. Is there stigma around trauma um, in populations uh, that live around the world, and, 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 and is there stigma around asking for help, Demir? Well, I, I would pre preface that with saying that, one, I don't think that most people have a unified understanding of what trauma is. It's certainly Western. The oh. definitions of traumatic stress in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is a product of the American Psychiatric Association. That's not to say that it's right or wrong, mm -hmm. it's, it's just an important contextualizing factor. That being said, when you're experiencing trauma, whether that be uh, momentary or continuous, it becomes part of your life, so you don't necessarily have an opportunity to think about whether or not it's stigmatized. I, to, to some degree, it's, in a, it's a position of privilege because, hmm. to me, that is life. To me, that is what I've gone through, and I may or may not know anything different. And being able to categorically assign it any sort of value does to some degree require being in a position of, of privilege. Great point. So what about substance use disorders in that context, Manuel? How do they manifest themselves? I think it's the same. Uh, for any underrepresented population, it's hard to trust uh, Western medicine. Uh, hmm. and, and so uh, when, you, when you think about how families address substance use disorders, you think about a, a lot of stigma being attached to uh, showing weakness uh, in, in having a mental, a mental illness. Um, so unfortunately, there's a lot of shame and a lot of resistance to want to get help because of how it's going to be perceived by members of the community and, and members in our own families. Um, so unfortunately, uh, stigma is real and uh, it's real for substance use disorders and any mental illness. Um, so we, we got to break through that barrier. And so how do we do that? I mean, um, whether it's uh, Ukraine, whether it's the southern border of the United States, whether it's Ethiopia or Sudan, there are people um, trying to flee uh, to, to a better life, uh, but you can't run away from your shadow, and your shadow does include the, the reality of trauma and substance use issues. How does society help these people? So another clarification that I'd like to make if you don't mind Please. is the difference between voluntary and forced migration. Yes. Voluntary migration is typically motivated by economic factors such as... Uh, graduate seeking, school. Right, graduate school. <laughs> and, and the United States has a different mechanism for immigration based on economic factors than those that are based on involuntary factors, whether that be human-made disasters, natural mm -hmm. disasters, mm -hmm. and, and that sort. The latter being really delineated and defined in, in international doctrine and law. And so because the United States uh, and its laws is grounded, excuse me, are grounded in the United States Constitution and not so much international policy, there comes a conflict where our domestic implementation of those acts is inconsistent with how it's meant to be implemented in other parts of the world. And so the path to coming to the United States for someone who's voluntary is significantly easier especially if they need a classification criteria of a certain status, like they are a highly ranked uh, cardiac surgeon. Whereas if you're involuntarily seeking asylum, not only are there multiple steps for you to, in order to arrive, for example, you first and foremost have to be outside of your country of origin, but you then have to meet a burden of proof that uh, uh, displays you are eligible and then that the ceiling or the limits, the numbers of uh, each country, are available and met, which sometimes take years after the fact. So is it, is it hard for um, refugees or immigrants to ask for help when it comes to substance use disorders or mental health conditions, Manuel? I think so. More than anything, lack of availability in one's own language. Uh, to access services. I think that's, the, that's mm. the number one block. There's that and then uh, just the fact that uh, trust is not easily earned and it's going to take time and um, organizations have to do a better job of making sure that they understand the communities that they're hoping to serve and uh, once that starts to happen then uh, people will start picking up the phone and reaching out and uh, if services are available in your language and people actually care about who you are, 
Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, a quick story. Um, and this, this actually happened to a personal friend of mine. Uh, grew up in Oaxaca, Mexico, and moved to the United States. Uh, forced migration. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that even though there's an a economic desire to come to the United mm -hmm. States to better your life, sometimes that's not what people want. People want to stay with their culture and with what they mm -hmm. grew up loving. Yes. Um, but she was forced to move to the United States seeking a better life. And some of her fondest memories as she sought therapy for the first time were of her working the fields, picking onions with her, with, with her father. And uh, as she was telling this story to the therapist, the therapist's response was, was this reported? Mm -hmm. You know, child labor is, is, is a thing here in the United States, right? What do you, what do you think happened? She never came back to therapy. She was never open to therapy ever again. So if instead of having that approach of uh, prejudgment uh, with people who come from different cultures, if we just ask questions and try to understand where people come from, she would have understood that this is something that her and her father chose to do together, yes. and it was a bonding experience. Just yeah. to add to that, so one of the, the Immigration nationality laws in the United States are actually more complex than the tax code. <laughs> and one of the defining characters of, uh, of those policies and laws is uh, moral turpitude. The U.S. Constitution uh, doesn't really reference immigration just really anywhere. It's, it's, it's in one place, but it's unclear. And the broad <laughs> definition of moral turpitude is what it is. It's broad. And going back to stigma, if someone self-identifies as you know, struggling with substances or, or mental health, it could be implied that there are... Uh, unfit. Right, that they're not fit mm -hmm. based on moral turpitude, that they don't have outstanding mm. character or a good character. So there's really no incentive, and based on the historical precedent in, in this country, right, where, you know, on one hand, the Statue of Liberty reflects and represents a hope for a better future. On the other hand, uh, there have been acts committed and perpetuated by the government that contradict that ethos. And I, go I, ahead. I just want to add real quick, you know, if there's a person going through an immigration process, even like myself uh, seeking citizenship now, not just permanent residency, uh, if I were to be honest, for example, if I'm suffering from a substance use disorder and I'm honest in my interviews about it, forget about it. Right. I'm, I'm not going to be able to stay in the U.S. Right. So th that's where we go back right. to trust. Yes, trust. Before we go, we've only got a couple of minutes. It, why is, we're a nation of immigrants. Mm -hmm. We are. We mm -hmm. It's our history. Why, academically and clinically, why are we not a nation that's set up to train more clinicians, more administrators, more down in the trenches, peer support specialists to work with diverse populations. Why are we not doing that? You know, life, I think. Most of us are trying to make it through life day by day and as those who are in recovery, maybe moment to moment. And we get caught up in the turbulence of a pandemic. Uh, financial setbacks and so getting back on track is more often than not difficult and challenging. That's not to neg negate the fact that there is a, a, a need but it doesn't have to be as extensive as setting up a framework. It can start with a conversation mm -hmm. because really that's how recovery starts. It's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last question before we go um, and even at Hazel and Betty Ford, I mean we're we're not far off from our 75th anniversary. We've been doing really good work for a long, long time, but we've been slow, right, Manuel and Demir? We've been slow to, 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 to recognize not just the need, but our responsibility to, to, to help people who come from other places. I think it's just a reflection of how society has been in the United States. You know, uh, I, I don't think that it's something that's unique to Hazel and Buddy Ford. On the contrary, being in the DEI committee for the NAATP, I can tell you that uh, other providers across the U.S. look up to us and see us as a leading example in mm -hmm. diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. So I don't think it's unique to our organization. But what I will say is I'm glad that it is now made a priority. Uh, and that resources are being allocated to make sure that we are providing culturally responsive care and that I really like hearing our, our leaders say 
that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a priority that, and that we're hoping to serve as many people as we can. Yes. Um, so uh, as much as, as I want to understand why it hasn't happened, I think that just it hadn't been made a priority. And now uh, something interesting for our organization is that we wanted to make DEI a priority before the murder of George Floyd. Now that kicked it into high gear, yes. absolutely, but mm -hmm. we were already thinking about doing it. And, being completely honest, that's where my focus is now. I, I, if, if I stopped and think about uh, why is Hazel and Betty Ford, why haven't we done it yet? Uh, it would be a setback. Right now we're looking forward and we're doing everything that we can so that moving forward we're seen as that leader and that provider mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for, for communities that are underserved. And so progress over perfection? You know, right, day at a time. Right. One day, do, you think, yeah. do you think it's realistic that we can, uh, as an organization, be um, more inclusive and meet those unique clinical um, needs of diverse populations? I, I think we already are. Mm -hmm. and, and to say uh, definitively in either direction to some degree would be naive because the landscape changes and we have to be flexible and adaptive. And, and I do think that, uh, that we are we're certainly on our way to that. And you all are leading that effort. You are shining examples of change and the change that's necessary to to meet the needs of more people because we know that addiction doesn't discriminate and neither should recovery. So Dr. Demir Ertzen, Manuel Garcia, thank you so much for being here today. And thanks to all of you for being uh, with us again. On behalf of our executive producer, Lisa Stangle and the A-Team at Blue Moon Productions, thanks for joining us. We hope you'll come back and tune in to another edition of Let's Talk. We'll see you again. <laughs>